Good morning, everybody. Okay, so I have a terrible confession to make. I've been playing video games my entire life. Entire life. Anybody else a gamer in here? Like, you like video games? There's a handful. Okay. So here's the deal. As soon as I was born, uh, my parents, you know, they gave me a computer. I started playing on that. But over the course of the years, my house has seen everything else. You know, I've had an Atari, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Sega Genesis, N64, Xbox, Xbox One, PlayStation, PlayStation 2. Uh, 360, did I say that one? I don't know. Uh, basically everything along the way. In my family, we, we always went to a bunch of um, arcades together, right? You know, we go to arcades, and there was actually this one Star Wars game that I would play every single time I went to the arcade. I got so good at it that I could actually beat it without continuing the entire arcade game. I thought it was really impressive. You guys were like, eh. I'm sure it, lo- it cost lots of quarters along the way. Now, uh, our favorite place to go was this spot called Disney Quest. Anybody ever been there before? It doesn't exist anymore, but it was great when it was around five stories of gaming goodness. On the top floor, there was this uh, interactive game called Invasion. And Invasion, what would happen is four people would get into this pod together. You get transported to an alien world, and you were there to rescue colonists who were being attacked by these aliens, right? And they would tell you, when you went into the game, they'd say, hey, there are X amount of colonists to save. So 24 colonists to save. And my family got so good at this game that we were rescuing more colonists than were there. <laughs> uh, I'm not joking. We come out, 27 colonists out of 24 saved. Like, the, the, the employees didn't know what to think. They were amazed, too. It was good. Now, here's the deal. My, my gaming addiction, it's genetic. I'm pretty sure my dad still plays more games than I do. And so as soon as I was born, they put a controller in hand. You know, I mean, we played together. Middle school, though, something started to change. Less and less did my dad want to play versus games with me. Instead, he wanted to play cooperative games. Why? Well, he's not here today, so I can tell you why. Because I'm better than him. <laughs> and skill-wise, I was better than him. I just had more natural skill. At least that's, that's how I perceived it, right? Now I'm getting a little bit older, and, and I'm starting to doubt that a little bit. My daughter Madison, when she was a kid, she started getting to the point where she was almost beating me at Mario Kart matches. And so when she went to school, I would sit down and practice for a couple hours just so I could stay ahead of her. My daughters Emma and Kate, they're, they're both growing in skills of their own, but just recently at a family uh, get-together, my, my nephew... Kaiden, he destroyed me at Super Smash Brothers. I mean, like, absolutely demolished me. And it, it, was, it was a bit embarrassing, really, because this kid, he's like five foot, floppy hair, sleeps 90% of the day. And I'm like, what is happening? I have hours and hours and days and, uh, of, of experience here, so much, so much skill and ability. Does this mean anything anymore? Is this what getting older is like? Is that, what, is that what's happening? Like, am I, am, I, am I destined to live the rest of my days playing cooperative games? Is that what's going to happen now? Um, now, I'm, I'm sure you've had an experience like that in your life where uh, you thought you were really skilled, really good at something, and then you met someone better. Or maybe, maybe you just had an ability all of your life that now it's starting to fade. You can't do the things that you once did. And this is tough because our world places so much emphasis, so much value on achievement, on success, on what you can do. What you can do is your identity. But the Bible would call this concept pride. Pride. And actually the Bible has a warning about this. It says that pride goes before a fall. Yeah. That doesn't sound good, right? So today we're going to be looking at this idea of pride in in the book of Daniel. And we're going to be talking about the cost of pride. And we're going to also talk about the, the biblical remedy to pride. Now, if you've been with us since the beginning of the month, we've been traveling through the Old Testament book of Daniel. It's about this Jewish prophet, Daniel, who lived 2,500 years ago. And Daniel had lived in the, the city of Jerusalem until this group, this empire called the Babylonians, had come along. And, and Babylon took him out of his homeland and transported them to their capital. In that capital city, Daniel was called to compromise his faith, 
to abandon this relationship that he had had with the most high God since his birth. Like, that's what he was called to do. But through the midst of it, instead of compromising, Daniel remained unshakable. He remained unshakable. And this is really important for us today because I, I don't know if you realize this or not, but we're living in a modern day Babylon today. I, and I'm not saying that America is worse than anywhere else. Any empire, any kingdom that is not the kingdom of God is Babylon. We're living in Babylon today. We're exiled, waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And until then, we've got to learn to be unshakable ourselves, to stand fast in our faith, to represent our God in all ways. And so we're looking at Daniel's life and the qualities that he had that helped to make him unshakable. In the first week, Joe talked to us about how Daniel viewed himself as set apart, as chosen. Week two, we learned about how Daniel had reorganized his priority system to make sure that God was the priority number one. Week three, we talked about worship, and actually it was some of Daniel's friends this time, and they showed us that what we worship matters, and we need to be worshiping the right thing, the right thing, no matter the cost. And today, we're going to be jumping into Daniel chapter 5. Now, I know if you're keeping up with us, that means I'm skipping a chapter. Don't worry, I can count. Uh, We're going to skip over chapter 4. Now, I do want to tell you, it's it's actually a great little story about pride and humility. And it includes a a king who starts eating grass. So, I mean, you might might be interested in checking that on your own. But we're going to skip directly to chapter 4. Five. But before we do that, I want to I want to throw a bone to the Bible nerds in the group out here. Okay, so first of all, in the 750 years leading up to the time of Jesus, there were a whole lot of world empires that started to form, and there were world empires that interacted with Israel. The first of these was the Assyrians, and in 721 BC, the Assyrians invaded Israel. They they completely destroyed the top half of the nation. And they got all the way to the walls of Jerusalem before being stopped. The Assyrians, they were known for being a little cruel. They would uh, take their captives after they had captured a city. They would line them up and kill every fourth person. They would then take the rest of the people and send them out throughout the empire to different places just to stimmy any possibility of revolt. After the Assyrians came the Babylonians. The Babylonians accomplished what the Assyrians did not. They captured Jerusalem. They placed a puppet king on the throne. But 10 years later, that king rebelled. And Babylon wasn't too happy about that. They returned to Jerusalem. They absolutely demolished the city, tore down the walls, destroyed the temple to God that was in the city. And this is where the story of Daniel takes place. Daniel is part of the exile of Jewish citizens that they pull out and send to these other places. He ends up in Babylon. After the Babylonians comes another group which we'll actually meet today. They're called the Persians. If you've seen the movie 300 at some point, you've seen a depiction of the Persians. And the Persians, uh, although they were very good at conquering things, they ruled in a slightly different way. They actually allowed people to return to their homelands and to rebuild. They allowed the Jewish people to rebuild Jerusalem. Not only that, the Persians actually paid for the rebuilding of the temple. Like, I mean, not so bad of a deal. But they were still, the people were still in exile. They were still ruled over a foreign power. Now, next comes two that you've probably heard of. First were the Greeks. They were led by Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great at the age, or in his 20s, he conquered more of the known world than any empire up to this point. But eventually his kingdom divided into three. And as they divided into three, they slowly fell to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire marks the beginning of something different. In our Bibles we call this the New Testament. It's the Romans who are in power when Jesus is born. It's the Romans who are in power when Jesus is crucified. It's the Romans that are in power for the next uh, 600 years as the early church tries to figure out how to survive and how to honor Christ in the midst of Babylon, in the midst of exile. So, now that you've gotten a quick glimpse of what Middle Eastern history look like. Let's talk about Daniel chapter 5. Now, you have Bibles, actually, right in the chairs in front of you. It's one of the ones that I'm using. And if you don't know how to get to Daniel, that's okay. It's on page 
695. That's where we're going to be. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Now, king is a bit of a misnomer here. This was actually the prince. The king was out fighting because, remember, Babylon was going up against another great empire at this time, the Persians. And so the king was out defending his lands. Meanwhile, the prince decides to throw a party. So Prince Belshazzar throws a party, and when he tasted the wine, he commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, and that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lord and his wives and his concubines they drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So up until 50 years before, these golden vessels, these golden cups and plates, they had been designated as gods in the Holy Temple. They were set apart. They were sacred. God's tableware, right? And here, this king, King Belshazzar, he decides to use them not to honor God, but to honor Himself, He gets a little tipsy, and he calls for the best tableware that they have. Brings them out. And they're all drinking from this, and they're drinking to honor the king and all of these gods. Do you, do you think this is going to turn into a good situation? Like, this is already getting a little messy. So he's sitting there in verse 5, Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall on the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. So, I mean, imagine this. Now, I know in a lot of scenes what we see in in like pictures and stuff, there's this hand that shows up, writes on the wall, and all the people are like, ah, what's happening? But as far as we know, Nebuchadnezzar, or Belshazzar, was the only one to actually see this hand. It was a vision that he may have seen here. He sees this hand, and he sees this writing on the wall. And so he does what every king before him does when there's a dream or when there's a vision. He calls the wise men. Or, well, verse 6, it first tells us, Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. He was really afraid. And so the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. And the king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Problem though, all of the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and the lords were perplexed. So yeah, all all these wise men, they couldn't get it. And this is actually, this is a kind of a, a common trope in the book of Daniel. We've already seen this happen a couple times. In chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He calls all the wise men. They can't answer. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He calls the wise men. They can't answer. But there's someone who can. There's someone who can. And thankfully, someone is around that remembers. The queen, and this is actually probably the queen mother, Belshazzar's mom, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So the queen mother remembered Daniel. She said, he can do this. He can do this. He can do this just like he did before. And look at how she describes him, right? She says, Daniel is full of light, full of wisdom, full of understanding. He can take care of this. And so they call to Daniel. And I'm going to skip a few verses ahead because there's just a lot of repeated material here. They call to Daniel. The king says, hey, if you do this, Daniel, I'll give you all of this wealth. I'll make you third in the kingdom. It'll be great. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. So Daniel gets offered all of this stuff. You interpret this for me? 
you can have all this wealth. And, and he says, no, I don't want it. Why? Well, for one, this is a message from God, right? You know, I mean, this is a vision that has been cast that the king needs to know. Daniel's not going to let money be an influencer here. He gets offered all this stuff. He knows, he knows that this message that he's about to give it isn't going to be nice. It's not going to be good. And he doesn't want it to look like that he's being influenced by the king to say something positive here. But before he tells him, tells Belshazzar what's written on the wall and what it means, he tells him why this has happened. So verse 18, he says, O king, the most high God came Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he, whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heavens. Until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and said it over whom he wills. So this is the story that's in chapter 4 that we skipped over. This is the story about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar starts thinking of himself a little more highly than he ought. And literally it says he goes crazy. God allows him to go mad. He goes from sitting at feasts to eating in the fields. And there he discovered something called humility. And God chose to raise him up again. And in chapter 4, he writes this letter, his letter to all the kingdoms saying, hey, this is what God has done for me. This was my experience. And so you need to worship this God because he is the true God. And Belshazzar, his son, he knows this story. He's been there. He was there through the midst of this. He knew what had occurred. And now Daniel turns to Belshazzar and he says, oh, Belshazzar, oh, Belshazzar. You, his son, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you've praised the God of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whom, whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored him. Belshazzar, you know all these things. You know all these things. And look, you're doing the same thing your father did. You're choosing the path of pride. You're throwing a feast in your honor. You're, you're using God's sacred silverware in your honor. You're not worshiping him. You're worshiping something else. He says, this is the reason that you get this vision. And here is what is written. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed on the wall. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mini, mini, tekel, and parson. This, and let me pause here and say why I think this is actually vision. These were all Hebrew words. They were Hebrew words. Hebrew is a, a common language. The Persians would have known they had conquered the Hebrews people. They would have had people who could speak Hebrew in their midst. But these are Hebrew words dealing all with measurement. But nobody can seem to read it. He says, this is the interpretation of that matter. Me, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Pyrrhus, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So yeah, we've got, we've got this first word, mini. And it shows up twice. It means number. But since it shows up twice, it's magnified. This means extremely limited. It's coming to an end. The king's reign is coming to an end very soon. Tekel, he says, Belshazzar, all those accomplishments, all those amazing things that you've done in your life, God's weighed them. They don't mean anything to him. They don't mean anything. And finally, Parson or Paris, Paris is just the singular version here. Parson means parted or have. Your kingdom is going to be divided into. Part of it's going to be given to the Persians. Part of it's going to be given to the Medes, who end up combining as one force here. So in essence, he's saying, Belshazzar, you made the poor choice. You've chosen pride, and it's going to have a cost. Your kingdom, you, done. 
And Belshazzar, he kind of plays it off. He continues the party and it says, Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck. And the proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Just kind of shrugs it off and keeps doing what he was doing beforehand. But that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean, he was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. So this is a historical event, guys, okay? I mean, like, not just from Scripture, but if you look into Babylonian records, if you look into the Persian records, in all accounts, the kingdom of Babylon, or the city of Babylon, was taken without having to drop any blood. Like, there was no fighting at all, and here's why. Earlier that day, Cyrus had defeated the Babylonian armies under under King Nebuchadnezzar. He had driven them away. King had, had fled to somewhere else, and he came up on Babylon. And throughout Babylon, it, remember, it's made up of all these different people's groups who all kind of hate the Babylonians because they took them and destroyed their nations and, and made their lives miserable. And these people, they chose to revolt. They handed, they just opened the gates when Cyrus and the Persians showed up. He walked into the city unmolested. And the king, well, his head rolled. Because of Belshazzar's great pride, the empire was lost. Now, you might be thinking, okay, that's a, that's a great story and all, but I, you know, I might have a little pride in my life, but it's not going to cause a disaster like that, right? Like, our pride isn't that bad, right? Well, the Bible would say otherwise. Check, it, check this out. Bible, just a couple of verses. It says, Solomon from Proverbs 16 says, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Everyone who is arrogant is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Paul says, for if anyone thinks he's something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Paul again says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. John the Apostle says, for all that is in this world, everything that the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And he links this to to humanity and sin all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the very first human beings. They chose this because of pride. James, the brother of Jesus, says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the to the humble. Now, I, like I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg here. There are hundreds of verses dealing with p- pride inside of Scripture. And when I read these things, it causes me to pause just a little bit because I struggle with pride. It causes me to reflect just a little bit because I have to ask myself, what's motivating my actions? What's causing me to make the decisions that I'm making? What is this rooted in? And a lot of times, like I said, it, it comes down to pride. Now, pride is a challenging word in our culture because it means a whole lot of things. If you look up pride in the dictionary, you're going to get a variety of different definitions. For instance, conscience of one's own dignity. That's not so bad, right? I mean, we were made in the image of God. Human beings have dignity built into them. That's not so bad. Reasonable self-esteem, confidence in oneself, also not bad. Respect and appreciation for oneself and others as a member of a group with a shared identity, history, and experience. That's not terrible, right? I'm, I'm proud of being part of this community at CCW. I'm proud that I get to serve God alongside of you. That's not a bad kind of pride. But check out some of these other descriptions. A feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. Pride in stuff. Pride in what we've done. Pride in what our kids have done, right? Pride. This, I mean, this we get because this is a big part of our lives. We like the stuff. The stuff in this world, well, it's part of security. It's also part of showing everybody else we've made it. We're successful. We've done the thing. We've had accomplishments along the way. Going on, showy or pretentious. No one likes someone like that. Like when you... When you describe someone with the adjective a prideful, that's not a nice thing, right? You say, that person's really prideful. You ever use that in a, a positive way? No, it's, it's a negative connotation. A high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. 
These are the definitions that you're going to find. Look it up in the dictionary. This is what you're going to find. And like I said, not all of these versions of pride are wrong. Self-esteem, confidence, respect, and appreciation, those, those are perfectly healthy attributes inside of a Christ follower. It's when we get to the other end of the spectrum that we start getting into trouble. Arrogance, overconfidence, conceit. And how about this one? This is, this is one you might be able to res- resonate with a little bit. Self-reliance. Self-reliance, relying on self. This is the one. See, here's the thing. Pride's pretty nefarious because I think a lot of times we look at very prideful people or uh, real proud people and we're like, well, we're not like that. But it's not the big pride that always gets us into trouble. It's the little things. It's the little pride, the the pride of self-reliance that I can do life on my own. I can figure this out. And pride always comes at a cost. Sometimes it's a big cost, sometimes a little cost, but it always comes at a cost. Recently, I, um, I built some shelves in our foyer area at our house. And I'll be the first to recognize I'm, I'm no carpenter. You know, I'm not going to get hired by anybody to come do projects at their home, nothing like that. But I can, you know, I can cut a piece of wood, I can stain it, I can finish it. And I'll tell you what, this turned out well. Okay, I'm saying that pridefully right now. This turned out well. And so I kind of figured in my head, like, oh, yeah, like, I got this. this. This is no problem, right? And so the next year, I decided to add some more of these shelves. And I, I did the same thing. I got the wood, cut it, finished it, stained it, all the, all the good stuff. I went to go install only to realize that these, these planks were uh, about three inches narrower than the planks I had gotten before. Completely useless. I lost $200 doing that, right, you know? And so I went out to Lowe's because this is what we do when we do projects, right? We don't go once. We go twice, three times, four times. I went out to Lowe's, and I went and bought the right size wood. I came, and I cut it, and I stained it, and I finished it, only to realize I had cut it to the wrong length. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You ever heard that, that saying, you know, measure twice, cut once? Yeah, I'm more of a measure once, cut thrice, buy twice type of guy. Like, that's how I roll. You know, and, and, and here's the thing. I know my dad, literally, he lives like an acre away. I can go and say, hey, dad, would you, would you give me some help with this? Like, you know, I could do that. But I figure that I can do this on my own. I want to be self-reliant. I want to say, I, I've done this before. I can do it again. I don't need anybody's help. And he got me into trouble that day. Pride comes at a cost. And uh, I'm sure you guys have probably done a project at some point in your life, right? There's five types of people when it comes to a project. Person number one, they know what they're doing. Right? We would call this confidence. Being confident is fine. Right? Being confident of what you can accomplish, that's fine. Then there's people who know what they're doing, and they tell everybody else what they're doing. <laughs> this is called arrogance. Right? We've met arrogant people before. We don't like arrogance. Those are the prideful people in life. Our third person is the person that thinks they know what they're doing and ends up paying the cost. That's me. That's called self-reliance or overconfidence, maybe, is another way of putting this, right? The fourth person is the person who knows they know, they know that they don't know what they're doing, and so they just give up. They don't do it, right? We don't like that. We don't like giver-uppers. That's no good. And then there's the fifth person who knows they know Man, that's too many no's in one sentence. (laughs) They know they don't know what they're doing, and so they call somebody else. They say, hey, come and help me out, right? And that's, honestly, that's called humility. Recognizing that you're not self-reliant, that you can't do this on your own, and asking somebody else to come alongside of you to do it. I I actually ran into this situation the other day. Uh, We're we're putting in some uh, hanging Kalex shelves, right? My wife and I in one of our rooms, and and uh, I know because she said, "Oh, well, I can I can maybe hold this." Have you met my wife, (laughs) Jenna? Are you in here? Okay, she's very strong. Oh, there you are. You're a very strong woman. I love you very much. Your muscle mass is like a child. Um, you know, and, and so we're looking at this and we're saying, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, we can do that. I'm like, you know what? Let's just pause. We'll wait. We'll wait until we get some extra help in here. We'll do this, right? You know, we recognize that we could not do this on our own. We chose not to lean into overconfidence. Instead, we leaned into humility. And so, like I said, confidence is fine. Humility is good. And actually, if I read Scripture correctly, what we're looking for 
to grow in our lives is a humble confidence. A humble confidence. And I can say that because I think that this is what Jesus displayed in his life. Check this out. Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And what follows is probably one of the earliest hymns that we have from the early church. The, the 2,000 years ago, okay? So this hymn has traveled down to us. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to read this aloud with me. You ready? Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I, I love this passage of scripture. It might even be my favorite chapter in t inside the entire Bible. And it seems to show up in like every, every other one of my sermons somewhere along the way. And so the reason this shows up is, is threefold. First of all, because I think it does give us such a beautiful picture of who Jesus Christ is. Now you got to understand, Jesus Christ was perfectly confident. He was perfectly confident. He knew who he was. He knew why he had come to this earth. He knew what he had come for. And he faced that head on. There was no weakness in Jesus Christ here. But that perfect confidence was shaped by a perfect humility. He chose a path of lowness, even though he was God. He didn't feel he deserved that. He came and became a human being, and he humbled himself. He gave up. He sacrificed for the sake of us, even going to the cross for us. A perfect confidence shaped by a perfect humility. The second reason that this passage is so important to me is because I struggle with pride. I struggle with pride. I, I struggle with it all the time. I have overconfidence in my own abilities to live a righteous life. I struggle with comparing myself to others and being judgmental. I struggle with surrendering to God's power, even though I know, I know that his way is so much better than my own. I struggle with pride, with overconfidence, self-reliance. I mean, like, even in preparing this sermon, you know, I find myself in the midst of a sermon realizing I haven't even turned this over to God. Like, I'm just doing this on my own ability because I know I'm an okay speaker. I know how, how to put some, a document together, but I can't change anybody's life. That's the spirit's role in all of this, right? And, and I realize that, that self-reliance is getting me into trouble and has gotten me into trouble so many times in my life. Quite honestly, like, listen, I stepped out of ministry because of my pride, because of what my pride had brought about. I've lost family and friends because of pride. I found myself in broken places again and again and again because of my pride. And in those broken moments, I look and I look at God and I say, hey, I'm going to do things different this way. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to surrender. And, and for a while I do, you know, and then things level out. And what happens? Pride rears its ugly head. I struggle with pride, but, but hearing this scripture, knowing this scripture reminds me of who I'm supposed to be. It reminds me of who Christ is, this Christ that I have committed my life to following and becoming like. He was a man of humble confidence, so I should be too. And the third reason that I think this passage is so important is because I believe that it reveals the prescription to pride. And we've already, you've already heard it multiple times here, humility, right? Humility, humility, humility. Um, humility is the solution to pride. Now, understand, that when we say humility, in the biblical sense, humility means a state of lowness. It's bound up in the action of, of choosing the lesser status, loving others more than yourself, sacrificing, giving. And that's what we see Jesus doing in this passage, Right? He's choosing humility. God in the flesh choosing to become a servant. 
washing other people's feet, being nailed to a cross. Humility. Humility is the solution to pride. So we know the heading, but how do we get there? How do we get to this place where humble confidence has rooted itself in our hearts and our minds and our thoughts and our actions? Unfortunately, many of us only get a dose of humility when we hit rock bottom, when we encounter the brokenness in our own lives. We hit rock bottom, we taste the feet, we lose relationships, jobs, stuff, we experience the cost, and that suddenly wakes us up to the fact that we cannot do this on our own. This was, this was Nebuchadnezzar's experience, right? Went from feast to field because of his pride. This was Belshazzar's experience. He lost the kingdom in his own head because of his pride. But this does not have to be our experience. And the reason I know that is because of Daniel. See, Daniel, he had lost so much. Remember, he was a young man when he was taken out of Jerusalem. He had lost his home city. He had lost family members, friends. He was dragged into exile. But when he got into exile, Daniel grew in status, in ability. He grew in, in confidence in himself, confidence in God. He, he was given power, and with that power came wealth. And yet, in spite of all of that, Daniel somehow, somehow managed to retain this humble confidence. I think part of that is because Daniel knew who God truly was. He knew who God truly was. I mean, look at some of the ways that, God, that Daniel describes God in this passage. He says, the most high God, the God whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, the most high God who has all of mankind's kingdoms, in the palm of his hand, like he knew who God was. And because he could see God truly, Daniel could see himself truly. He could see himself truly. So he wasn't out for status or power. Instead, he relied on God to lead him through life in Babylon. He wasn't out for the reward because he realized that he was living life in exile and that God had something so much better in store for him. That, to quote some of Daniel's friends who we heard from last week, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known, be it known that we still won't serve you, O king. See, they had a confidence placed in the right thing, right? Not a confidence placed in the self, a confidence placed in God and what God could truly accomplish. Because when you see God truly, you truly see yourself. And when you truly see yourself, guess what you see? You see your needs. You see your failures. Your, you see your lack and ability of coping. You see your brokenness and imperfections. You see your, your lack of ability to do life on your own. That's what you see. But, but you also see God's love. And you also see God's mercy and God's grace. You see his goodness and his faithfulness. You see your worth, your great worth through his eyes. You see those broken pieces healed. You see those shattered parts of your life restored. You see hope and life to the fullest. This is what we see when we truly see God and truly see ourselves. And that makes humble confidence, well, a little more easy to grasp. We've got to learn to see God so that we can see ourselves. So this is who we're called to be. If this is who Jesus Christ is, the, the, the perfect example of humble confidence inside this world, then we're called to become like him because that's what Christian means. Little Christ, we're following him. We have made Jesus king of our lives, and we're trying to become like him. So I've got a few tips for you today, just how to put this into practice and begin down the road of building humble confidence into your life. The first is this. Choose transparency. Choose transparency. Uh, the staff right now is reading a book by Ruth Haley Barton, and one of the things she says in there that I absolutely loved was, honesty is the end of self-reliance. Because it is, when we're honest with ourselves, like I said, we realize our brokenness, we admit our faults, we, but this isn't the world we live in. Like our world, they, they like to slap masks on things. I mean, like, uh, no filters, you know what I mean? Like, you jump on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, people don't put their real selves up there. You know, this is what we're trained for from youth now, to make ourselves look, look like we have it together. 
to make a claim that we have some status or ability to hold things together in our lives. But those masks, they're empty. And when you're truly real with people, when you truly admit your brokenness, something happens. In fact, the, the, the book of James, it says that confession, when we confess to one another, we will be healed. You get that? When we admit our faults and our brokenness, that we don't have it together, then healing comes. People tell me, man, it's so brave of you to get up on the stage and admit your faults, to admit you're prideful, to admit that you don't have it all together. That's not true. That's not true. I do these things because it gives healing to my life. In fact, it's a little selfish here. I want to be the person that God designed me to be, and the only way to get there is to help myself recognize who I truly am. And I believe that healing can come when we're real with one another. And, and notice, James doesn't say just confess to God. You know what I mean? Like this is a temptation. Is oh, well, I'm just going to tell God about my bad things. No, you've got to talk to other people because other people provide insight. They provide help. They provide support. They provide encouragement. They build you up when you're, when you're falling down. And not only, they sometimes those other people can see things that you can't see. You need to confess to one another. And so we've got all kinds of groups here at CCW. We've got Celebrate Recovery, this, this spot where you can deal with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And real confession is happening. And as a result, real healing is happening. Last week, last week we had a baptism from Celebrate Recovery. And it's because that gentleman, he began confessing and being real with the brokenness in his life. And it led him to his need for Jesus Christ. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Choose transparency. Second thing I would recommend is if you're wrestling with pride, memorize Philippians 2, 3 through 11. This is the passage that we read together today. Memorize it. Carry it with you. It's, and, and this is why I always tell people about memorization. It's a lot more important to have God's word in you than having God's word with you. Okay, it's great that we can pull it out and look at God's Word on our phone or in the Bible, but when we travel with it, it reminds us. It comes at these points when we need it the most, you know, not when you're going to pull it out and look it up in Scripture. Like, it comes to you in that moment. So take some time, memorize Philippians 2. It's been so helpful to me. This practice of memorizing has been so helpful to me in my life. And this passage especially has been so critical and so important. And the third thing is this. Um, and this is to everybody in the room, but especially I want to speak to the non-Christ followers at this point, is maybe it's time to surrender. Maybe it's time to really reflect on your life and realize that you've been throwing your own party instead of going to the party that God wants to give you. Maybe it's time to stop doing things your own way. You see, Jesus Christ is king, and Jesus Christ is king whether you like it or not. I mean, that scripture we talked about in Philippians 2, it says that every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow in all places at all times to Christ the King. Not because we made him king, because he is king and we recognize him as the king that he is. And so we come to church and we, and we talk about this stuff and we talk about how you know, we want to improve, but we don't want a moral improvement, guys. I hope you understand that. Like Our job isn't just to be better people. Good people still go to hell. But because of Christ, because of Christ and his spirit, we can have hope of something better. We don't have to do life on our own, so maybe, just maybe, it's time to surrender. It's time to stop spinning your wheels and trying to dig yourself out of the, the mess that you've made. Stop living in brokenness and start instead leaning into Jesus Christ to choose God. Because for every failure we have, God has a success. And he's got a success for you too. So let's pray, and then we're going to worship together. Father, I pray thank you. I thank you that you've given us this word that can speak into our lives. We thank you for the spirit that can convict us. And, and Father, I'm, I want to pray just something kind of scary here, but open our eyes to the brokenness in our lives. And if we don't sense that brokenness yet, Father, I ask that you bring us to a place where we recognize our need for you. Help us to see that we are not enough on our own, that it's only through you that we can hope to succeed in this life and in the next. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can hope to have it forever, a party in eternity with you, Father. I, I just, I pray that today, if there's someone in this room that, that needs to surrender to Jesus Christ, that you convict them to step forward, to, to step beyond where they're sitting, to have that conversation.
And as our prayer team comes up here and as we worship this last song, Father, I ask that you move in people's hearts, move in people's minds, and that they choose surrender, that they choose baptism into something new, becoming something new with your spirit inside of them. Help us to be people of humble confidence. Help me to be a person of humble confidence. As I walk through my week, help me to, instead of turning to myself as the answer to every problem, to turn to you as the solution. We thank you, Father, and we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.